Hello everybody, this is Mentor Lawyer. I'm going to be doing a video today about the case of State of Florida versus Donna Adelson. And there are several motions that were filed. The first one that I'm going to address is the motion by defendant Donna Adelson to hold trial in courtroom 3B. So I figured that makes sense for you guys to take a look at courtroom 3B and you can take a look at my last ever felony trial. So that's me in courtroom 3B, Leon County Courthouse, and this is a courtroom. So as you can see, there are two, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but two small counsel table. I'm on the, I'm standing on the other side there. The defendant has a blue shirt behind me. There's a law clerk, a law student who was helping out at the trial. The judge is sitting up here to the right. Very tiny courtroom, as you can see. And then there's the gallery, and the gallery is behind the attorneys, right? Similar to courtroom 3G, but there is a difference, a big difference, of course, is that the courtroom is a lot smaller. Now, the arguments being made by the defendant have to do with violations of the rules by people who attended the trial against Charles Adelson. So they allege that somebody maybe more than one people, more than one person, the people were surreptitiously, that is without permission, making recordings during the trial. Somebody took a photo supposedly of a note that was being passed during jury selection. And he makes the argument without any proof or any affidavit or anything of the sort, that I'm talking about whoever wrote that motion, they make the argument that because the phone went off during the trial, and I think it was, uh, one time it was for sure Ruth Markell because a phone went off during the trial that those people must have been trying to record the proceedings surreptitiously. Now, I attended the trial. I would say that if somebody's phone went off, it's more likely because they just forgot to silence it, not because they're trying to record anything because you don't need to have the phone uh, to record something. You don't have to have the phone with sound. I actually record trials all the time with my cell phone, trials and nobody else watches or gives much care about not many people do so i do i try to cover some of those cases that don't get a lot of attention that the media doesn't go and cover and i usually use my cell phone and i don't need to put it in silent mode to record quite the opposite i on purpose put it on silent mode because i don't want the phone going off while i'm recording so that portion of the argument doesn't make any sense now let's talk about the other argument Oh, well, you're going to limit the size of the people who are going to be watching this trial, right? So because you have a smaller courtroom, there's less people to react to the testimony. So they're saying we're not going to limit the public's access so the public will still be able to watch. And just like there are so many other trials in courtroom 3B, why shouldn't this one be there? And what they're trying to do, of course, is they're trying to limit the size of the number of people that can go into the courtroom and watch the trial. There are a lot of problems with this motion. First of all, it will have a very negative impact on the media unless there's some kind of routing that can be done with long cables or whatever to a different room or a different courtroom or a different media room because this particular courtroom right there where you're watching me is got a media room that is the size of a small bathroom in a hotel room. So in essence, you can fit two people in there at max at one time. There's hardly any room for any equipment. And you can imagine at the prior trial and prior trials before that about this case, there were several media outlets that were there share, sharing the media feed, included Deep Dive to Crime, Mental Lawyer Justice Network, that's me, we were accessing the feed. Court TV was filming, you have Law and Crime Network, you had um, WCTV, the local station, and you had a couple more. Tallahassee Democrat, of course, uh, publishes the trial live. So you can imagine that if we're gonna be using that little teeny tiny uh, media room, it's gonna be impossible, pretty much. You can watch for yourselves. And what you're gonna see is that everybody's really close to the gallery, right? Everything is so close. And the jury, you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, 
of the screen, that's where the jury box is. So the distance between the jury and the people watching, which of course will definitely include the Markel family. I mean, they should be allowed in, right? So there's going to be also benches for the media. So let's talk about the logistics here, right? At the last trial on Quadrant 3G, on the right hand side, do you have this very uncomfortable wooden band, uh, benches? The first two rows were reserved for media. So it was people like me, like the reporters from the Tallahassee Democrat, reporters from WCTV, camera crew, um, photogra the, the photographer. There's only one assigned photographer for the trial. There's only one media outlet that's going to be the pool camera in this last trial. The judge allowed two cameras, right? One was by the gallery and the other one was behind the witnesses. So you had two different angles and the camera could point towards the defendant and the defense attorney and the prosecutors. And it could also point towards the witness and the judge. So you presumably will have to give the media some access so they can do their work because this is a highly covered case, right? So they'll have to do their work. That's going to limit even more the access of non-media people to this courtroom because literally, I think there's only three to four rows behind this. Look, that's it. That's the last bench over there. So you can see there is one row, two rows. There may be one more row behind Monica Jordan right here. That's Monica Jordan on the left. And this is the Tallahassee Democrat reporter on the left. Those are the last two people. And then there's one all the way in the back. Usually the bailiff sits there to make sure that everybody's behaving. That's it. So, I mean, literally, this is going to be almost nobody attending this trial. I mean, we're talking about maybe 30 people max in courtroom 3G. Of course, things are a lot different. But also take a look at the same. Look at the distance between the people and the jury. I mean, we're literally talking very close, just feet away, feet away from the witnesses, feet away from the judge. The courtroom 3G is, of course, much bigger than this. You know, <laughs> between the judge and the first bench is probably the back wall of this courtroom. So the same thing with the jurors. You would think that in a smaller courtroom, there could be a lot more distraction that the jury will notice if the concern of the defense is the people's faces, right? Because there was one of their concerns was, oh, okay, so there was, um, you know, somebody took a photo, somebody recorded it surreptitiously, supposedly. But then the other concern is that at some moment, I guess this one juror who everybody was suspicious of, who had turned out to be an alternate, apparently he must have complained. I wasn't present when this happened, but he complained, I guess, that some people were reacting to the testimony and uh, that may influence him or other people in the jury. Obviously, it wouldn't influence him. It seems to me that he was feeling a different way about the testimony, and therefore, he didn't like the fact that people were reacting in a different way than he was, I guess, and that jurors could see that. I guess he should have been paying attention to the witness, not to the jury, so maybe he should be following the rules a little more. But in any case, I mean, if that's one of the main arguments, probably the main argument, so you have a balancing of two issues, right? So one is the number of people present, and then the other is the distance. So wouldn't you be a little more worried about the distance? You have the parents of Dan Markel and other people who may have, and the parents of Dan Markel are very professional, but certainly, of course, there's a lot of other people who follow this case and they want justice for Dan Markel. They may feel or react certain ways to some testimony, for example, when Wendy's testifying or when Professor Lacasse is testifying, some of the key witnesses. I don't see the logic from a defendant's perspective of wanting to be in such a tight courtroom where you're basically you know, leaving the audience, the gallery people, so close to the jury. It seems to me that a bigger courtroom would be better in that regard. 
And, you know, I think the state of Florida has a long track record of being a state that has sunshine laws that protects our constitutional right to check on the government to make sure that every bit, everything is being done properly, correctly. And, you know, what better way than to have people, a large number of media, writers, there's, I would say, you know, on the gallery in courtroom 3G, the left side, if you're sitting at the, if you're the judge and you're looking at the gallery, the left side, the majority of people on the left side, at least in the first five, six rows, were people that had some professional interest in the case or family members of that Markel. And we're talking about the number of people that probably wouldn't fit in the courtroom to be. As you can see, it's a very tiny, tiny gallery. So you're gonna just let the professionals be there. We're gonna limit the number of professionals that can be there. The motion has zero case law, except for the general proposition that the public should have generally unrestricted access to all judicial, judicial proceedings and some general case law that talks about the fact that uh, that access has limitations. It's not uh, the, the, the court can impose restrictions just like the judge does in every proceeding. You know, they want to make sure that there's a quorum. They want to make sure the rules are followed, so on and so forth. So uh, there's no case that they cite where the issue of moving to a smaller courtroom because it might affect how the jurors will react to the gallery. So this is just the beginning of my research. I may do a little more, but I am highly efficient when it comes to research. And I usually find case law that almost nobody else does. The first case I found so far, which I'm going to just mention to you because I want to show you that this was not the first time ever that this has been argued. It was argued by a by, uh, person who was convicted and got a death penalty somewhere. So this case is called James B. Ashford versus Jerry Gilmore, the warden. This is a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, the United States Court of Appeals. So the Seventh Circuit, I think that's Colorado probably. Illinois, Colorado, uh, and um, maybe Illinois. And this is a 1999 opinion. So somebody got uh, convicted of murder and armed robbery, and the conviction was affirmed. And then there was a denial of a post-conviction motion for relief, and it was affirmed. And then the defendant sought habeas corpus in the United States District Court, the District Court uh, for the Central District of Illinois has denied the petition, and then the petitioner appealed. So now it is before the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And the issue is an effective assistance of counsel. And I'm going to read the section where it talks about this issue. And here's what it says. Um, Ashford, so the defendant was Ashford. Ashford's trial was severed from Jones. So there were two defendants and they got separate trials. Ashford waived trial by jury and was convicted of four counts of intentional murder, four counts of felony murder, and one count of armed robbery. Two days before the sentencing hearing was held, uh, some lieutenant and assistant jail administrator for the sheriff's department sent the state court judge, in this case, a letter discussing safety precautions to be utilized at the sentencing hearing. This letter read, so this is from a jail administrator. And it says, Your Honor, it has been brought to my attention that inmate that James Ashford has let it be known to another inmate that he intends or has at least made reference to the fact that he is going to become a problem in the court following his sentencing. The outcome of his sentence is, of course, known only to you at this time, but I submit that it shall be severe, and Mr. Ashford may well have nothing to lose by a display of this type which could become quite serious. We have spoken to Mr. Roberts, the prosecutor in Ashford's case, about this matter, and he seems to be in favor of our staff keeping handcuffs with a security belt and leg irons on this individual throughout the entire process on the 16th. With all due respect to the court, I ask for your approval in this matter, and although as unusual as it may seem, I can assure you that many members of our staff 
has observed a growing sense of hostility and apprehension with this inmate. Further, I ask for you to order for your order to set up a metal detecting search procedure with all observers and that we utilize the smallest courtroom available to limit the size of the gallery. So uh, I don't think that they actually discussed the merits of the request to move it. But I think obviously here was a request based on safety issues, based on uh, concerns about what the defendant said that he might do during his sentencing. So um, it does talk, in this case, it does talk a little bit about safety precautions, taking it to the courtroom, blah, blah, blah. The letter itself doesn't relate to any specific instances of bad conduct by Ashford. So it says, but we need not speculate, we need not speculate whether or not the trial judge was improperly influenced by this letter. The trial judge stated his reason for imposing the death penalty and the security memo was not one of them. Oh, I see. So they're trying to argue that, that the judge was influenced by this letter when he decided to impose the death sentence. So I did find an article that discusses this issue. Of course, this is the legal article, the type of legal article that would have been written by someone like Professor Dan Markell. These are long, complicated documents that take some time to read and process. The title of the document is Sufficiency of Courtroom Facilities as Affecting Rights of Accused. Public trial. It has been held under the following circumstances that the trial court properly denied a defendant's motion requesting on the basis of the constitutional right of a public, to a public trial that the case be tried in a larger courtroom. So the defendant wanted a larger firm. However, see State versus Hensley. This is a 1906 case out of Ohio, where it was held that the trial court's general order excluding ex spectators from the courtroom made in connection with its shift to a smaller courtroom for the taking of testimony in a statutory rape prosecution denied the accused his state constitutional right to a public trial. Trial judge, in order to take the testimony of witnesses likely to give immoral or obscene testimony concerning the alleged incident of statutory rape, moved the trial from the large general courtroom to the smaller probate courtroom, from which all but court officers, the defendant and his counsel, and newspaper men were excluded. So only the people from the news were there, only the court officers, bailiffs, and all that and the defendant is counsel. So holding that a public trial means one which is not restricted to any particular class of the community, but is one to be free observation of all, the appellate court agreed with the holding of the intermediate court that the resulting exclusion was too general and too restrictive and in excess of the power of the court. The court held that the state constitutional right to a public trial does not impose upon the authorities a duty to provide so large a place for public trials as would accommodate every member of the community at the same time, but that it does import the duty to make reasonable provision, which is usually met by ample courtroom accommodations. So in a sense, as you can see, at least in this case that I just discussed, it was actually the defendant asking for a public trial, not the prosecutor, not the defendant asking to go to the smaller courtroom. All right. Then they cite to a 1973 case, a state versus learner out of Rhode Island, Rhode Island. The court rejected the accused's contention that the trial judge had erred in denying the accused motion to conduct the trial in a larger courtroom and thus ensure the accused rights to a public trial guaranteed by the 6th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution. The court stated that there is no basis, that no basis was established in the record that the size of the courtroom in any way deprived the accused of a fair trial that the trial judge had denied the motion in the exercise of his discretion and had pointed to factors which militated against a change of courtroom. And three, while it was suggested that the public would be excluded from the trial, nothing in the record established that the public was actually excluded. And four, that on the basis of the record and the briefs presented, the court was unable to conclude that the accused had been prejudiced in any way by the size of the courtroom. So those cases, are like the defendants arguing that they they should have that you know they shouldn't be convicted in the dark 
this should be a public trial that people should be able to see what the government's doing. We want the government there. But Donna doesn't. I guess it's because Donna doesn't feel like she has many peers in Tallahassee or many peers among the people that want to go and watch this trial. Impartial jury, right held violated. In the following cases, the courts have ruled that the crowded condition of the courtroom, and by the way, 3B will be crowded, that's for sure. <laughs> In the following cases, the courts have ruled that the crowded condition of the courtroom violated the accused right to an impartial jury trial. All right, so here we go. 1913 case, People versus Fleming, where the court, although focusing its decision reversing a murder conviction on the misconduct of the prosecutor, blah, 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 and the closing arguments, also commented on the crowding of the courtroom in connection with the observation that a trial court should take every precaution to see that the public sentiment is not expressed in the presence of the jury in such a way as to influence their determination. So this is not, this is someone else. I mean, this is a 1913 case talking about this issue. So from the issues raised by Donna Edelson through her attorneys here to try to change the courtroom, okay, the whole issue about the phone going off or Somebody violating the rules and surreptitiously recording. I don't see how changing the courtroom will change that. But the one argument that they make that I can see that there's some basis on it so far from my very limited research is this whole thing about the reactions of the people in the, in the gallery. Now, they only cited one example of one situation where one of the jurors in the Charles Edison trial complained that there were people making faces in the gallery. I don't know that that's enough. I mean, the judge was sitting there throughout the whole trial, and he did warn people several times about behavior, about the phones, and all this stuff. So maybe the judge also had a feeling that he didn't like what was going on in the gallery. And if that's the case, if the judge felt that way in the Charles Edison trial where he was distracted by people in the audience Faces that they were making, et cetera, et cetera. Then, I mean, we can see that there is some case law on this issue. So the judge might be inclined in doing this for that particular argument. But really, I think he really should think about this thoroughly. Because, like I said, there are other factors to consider here. You got to consider the fact that you're going to limit the size of the courtroom drastically. So, what is the judge going to do? There's Half of the gallery, for sure, will be media people. There is a ton of media people that attend, that take notes, and all this stuff. And I can tell you that I personally felt that it was a bit distractive, not the people in the gallery, but actually us, the media. Not me so much, because I have a cell phone, and I was watching, and I was you know, concerned not to interfere with the proceedings, and I did not take my laptop in there and type it. However, several reporters, several people in the media were allowed to bring their laptops and just type away. And you can just hear the keyboard. So, I mean, uh, it was a little bit of a distraction. Anyway, let me see what, it said, what, what this uh, court said in People versus Flaming in 1913 in California. So the court commented on the crowding of the courtroom in connection with the observation that a trial court should take every precaution to see that the public sentiment is not expressed in the presence of the jury in such a way as to influence their determination, if there be anything in the guarantee of a fair and impartial trial. From newspaper accounts, which were verified by affidavits, the court recited evidence that the courtroom was so crowded that the doors could not be opened or closed and that the trial judge was obliged to warn that the building having never seen having never been subjected to such weight might collapse a circle of spectators extended within the bar to the platform on which the trial judge sat and virtually crowded the defendant and his few supporters out of their seats according to the newspaper account when the prosecutor was observed entering the courtroom on the day of the final argument a riot of applause ensued for 30 seconds this doesn't sound at all like the trial of State of Florida versus Charles Edelson. We're talking about a crazy courtroom here with people spewing out everywhere. The judge in this case did a very good job 
on trying to limit the distractions. He, for example, made a rule that once testimony starts, nobody comes in and out of the courtroom. So state calls a witness, witness gets on the witness stand. That moment, the doors are shut and nobody's coming in and out. Unless maybe there's an emergency or something. But nobody's coming in, that's for sure. Maybe somebody might be able to come out. But nobody's coming in. Uh, the judge, of course, does have the right to tell people to behave well, to exclude people from the courtroom. So there's tons of other ways to ensure that that doesn't happen, right? That the people that are maybe trying to influence the result, there's not going to be any applause, all that stuff. The judge has bailiffs present and can remove anybody who is behaving poorly. Now, no judge wants to do that. No judge wants to waste his or her time policing the people in the gallery, especially in a murder case, especially in a case where people really want justice for something horrible that the, accuses are, uh, the, the defendant is accused of having done. And, and you know, if I'm if I were the judge, you know, that's not the, that's, I don't want to do that. And it feels bad in a sense that you have to kind of scold people, especially the family members of the victim. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to be there, in, to be in that situation. But I think the judge overall can easily control the courtroom and maybe can be a little more stern. If the judge did observe some things that he didn't like from the last trial, he can still keep 3G, but he can maybe put a little bit harsher rules in place where he says, listen, there's only people in the media here. They can use their laptops. Let's say that he allows them to use the laptops again. Maybe he should say, you know what? Anybody who's going to be typing on a laptop or any kind of keyboard, you got to be in the back of the courtroom. Who knows? He can change the rules to make it a little less distracting for the jury. Um, but changing the courtroom I mean, you can see that this People v. Fleming case, we're talking about a crazy crowd and the trial, applauding, uh, people spewing, you know, uh, almost no, no place for any supporters of the defendant in the courtroom. They're all squeezed out by the mob that is trying to make sure that this person is convicted. So let's see, any other case here? That was California, 1913. Let's go to 1895. <laughs> in Myersville State out of Georgia, the court reversing a murder conviction on other grounds recognized that the presiding judge should not have permitted the bar or the courtroom, courtroom to become so crowded as to impede the progress of the trial by rendering it difficult for the jurors to enter or leave the jury box or by preventing the free movement of counsel and witnesses. And the jury should not be in such close and constant, constant contact with the audience that remarks of bystanders as to the guilt or innocence of the accused or other indications of public feeling for or against him might reach their ears or come under their observation. The defendant alleged in the, that the courtroom was crowded almost to suffocation by an immersed swarm of people packed like sardines in a box and jammed about the judge's stand on or around the council's table and all around the jury, and that the crowd was greatly prejudiced against the defendant. The court recited that counsel for the defendant could not get seats during the prosecutor's closing argument, and that the two of them were compelled to sit on top of a table in front of a large crowd between them and the jury, while another defense attorney was forced to stand in the courtroom, in the courtroom doorway. So as you can see, when courts have addressed this issue, we're talking about significant likelihood that the jury is being influenced by a huge crowd, an unruly courtroom. Another article that might have something good for the prosecution here is this. It's, it's called, it's, it was written in more recently in 2009 as part of the, uh, published in the Emory Law Journal. Emory is in Atlanta, Georgia, awesome law school. And it's called Scaling Waller, How Courts Have Eroded the Sixth Amendment Public Trial Right. The, a fair trial is the objective, and a public trial is an institutional safeguard too for attaining that. Citing 
Judge Harland in Estes versus Texas, 1965, the United States Supreme Court. So where is the erosion coming from? The erosion would be, you know, judges, um, you know, using their discretion, their power to do something like that. Like, for example, to move, a, you know, this is just an example of something where, you know, if there is a right to a public trial, which usually the defendants want, and it can go both ways, right? So you have situations where the defendant wants a larger courtroom because they want the trial to be able to see what the heck is going on, to, what the state's doing to them. And there are situations where it was just so overcrowded and it was all pro-defense, I'm sorry, pro-prosecutor, for example, or pro-victim, and now they're arguing the opposite, right? That the judge should have kept some more control of the courtroom. I don't see anything that comes even close to the very few things that happened in the case in the trial against uh, Charles Adams. And so I really, personally, I don't think Judge Everett should go there. Now, he was sitting on the bench throughout the whole trial. I wasn't. He got the best view of everybody. Best view of everybody about what's going on in the gallery. Now, he is probably not used to a lot of big trials. The vast majority of the trials that he does, there's very few people in the audience. Very few people. I have watched the trial that he did where there was a huge audience of people that seemed to be hostile towards the prosecution, towards the prosecution witnesses. And he allowed the case to be trialed in the courtroom 3G. Now, I don't think anybody made a motion to move it to a smaller courtroom. But in that trial, he was constantly uh, interacting with uh, the people in the gallery about their behavior at some moment, about the disrespectful dress, the way that they dressed. Uh, he, he seemed quite uh, harassed by the atmosphere in that trial. And so, you know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that Judge Everett will see this as an opportunity to address an issue that maybe has been brewing in his mind and that maybe nobody ever argued to him, right? So maybe he might be sympathetic to this idea but I think it would be a mistake in this case because obviously he has, uh, the judge has seen obviously cases that were worse, like the one that I'm telling you about. That's the case where I think it was a gang dispute here in Tallahassee and there was a drive by shooting outside of a little store and somebody got killed. And then two other people who were maybe in the car testified against the alleged killer, and there were threats being thrown against those two guys. And one of those two guys was also facing a similar murder charge out of Georgia. So some people were thinking that that's the real killer, why they're trying this guy. The real killer is the state's witness. And so there was a lot of, uh, it was a heavy, heavy gallery, heavy in the sense of there was tension in that courtroom. When you got in there, you felt it. Countervailing values and interests, the justification for courtroom closure. What is this about? Most discussions of the public trial guarantee take as their premise the age old fear of despotic regimes, as well as concern over possible abuse of judicial power and the need to safeguard against any attempt to employ courts as instruments of persecution. Blah, blah, blah. Perhaps it is because of these concerns that quorums have been closed in the United States relatively rarely by government officials pursuing their own objectives or seeking to quash dissent. Instead, as evidenced by the case, cases discussed in Davis, courtroom closures since the late 19th century appear to have been triggered most often by sex crime prosecutions. Historically, these closures have been justified by a desire to preserve public morals and public decency or to elicit sensi sensitive testimony from victims. Other justifications for courtroom closure include preserving the anonymity of a police officer in an undercover buy and bust drug investigation, encouraging testimony by witnesses who fear retaliation, and maintaining public safety and order in the courtroom. 
Preventing disclosure of sensitive government information is also a compelling interest that sometimes justifies closure. With the advent of victims' rights movement and heightened sensitivity towards sex crime victims in particular, prosecutors and courts have often justified courtroom closure as necessary to protect the dignity and psychological integrity of the victim and to encourage victim testimony. Courts have paid particular attention to these issues where children and teenagers are concerned. Without clear guidelines for courtroom closure, it is not surprising that different judges assessing even similar facts and weighing similar interests, such as protecting the psychological integrity of a rape victim, might decide differently about excluding the public. What is important to note is that the range of countervailing interests that have been cited to justify courtroom closure. The next section examines the leading U.S. Supreme Court cases on the issue, including two where closure was requested by the defendant in the interest of a fair trial. Ah, wow. Interesting. Those two cases should be interesting. Richmond Newspaper versus Virginia. Oh, let's go take a look there. And now let's take a look at a United States Supreme Court case where the defendant wanted the court closed. There's two of them. Let's go with the 1980 case. Richmond Newspapers, Inc. versus Virginia. Certiorari was granted to review dismissal of mandamus and prohibition petitions by the Virginia Supreme Court. Okay. Held that absent overriding interest articulating in findings, trial criminal criminal case must be open to public. And again, of course, we're talking about something much more drastic here, but there may be some of the analysis here that could be similar to what the judge should be evaluating in this case, because it is a very unusual argument, right? So the early history of open trials in part reflects a widespread acknowledgement long before there were behavioral scientists that public trials had significant community therapeutic value. Now, let's be fair here, right? I mean, this trial will be televised, hopefully with high quality cameras again from Court TV. So everybody will get to watch it, right? So the question is just who's gonna be there in person appearing on camera, I guess. So a lot of the cases are gonna be from times when there were no cameras in the courtroom and the only way to watch this trial would be to be there in person. And even now in federal court, you don't get to have uh, cameras. You um, have to be in the gallery to watch the trial. And then you have reporters going there and you have sketch artists and all this stuff. So uh, there is a huge difference here, which in a sense uh, makes it when you have to weigh the scales, right? You got to weigh the scales of the right of the public to watch versus the right of a defendant to have a fair trial. Thereafter, the open processes of justice serve an important prophylactic purpose, providing an outlet for community concern, hostility, and emotion. Without an awareness that society's responses to criminal conduct are underway, natural human reactions to of outrage and protest are frustrated and may manifest themselves in some form of vengeful self-help. So all these arguments that are in favor of making criminal trials public are before the advent of what has happened. To some extent, it has been happening for a while, right? There was, for example, the O.J. Simpson trial. There have been a few cases that have been televised. I think even Ted Bundy got on TV quite a bit. But for the most part, you know, in the history of of our country and uh, the criminal trials, for the most part, thanks so much, Elias. You know, those people who were in the audience would be the ones that got to watch the trial. So this is a little different because we do have awesome cameras and everybody can watch. They can even watch from right outside. You have their cell phones and they can watch like some of the testimony I watched from the media room. I just got tired of having to behave myself and be restricted and be on those uh, harsh wooden benches. And I would just go to the media room and just watch my phone and comment to you guys, take a little break from sitting there. So um, anyway, that weighs in favor of granting 
the defendant's motion to go to courtroom 3B, which again, I, I hope that the judge doesn't do. My primary concern is the media room. And so unless there is a workaround and there is a way for the people that are gonna access the feed to have proper room to maneuver, to set up their equipment and all that stuff, uh, I just don't see how you can have this trial done in courtroom 3B. There may be another alternative. There may be another room that is better than 3B. And so it may very be it may be very possible that we will end up with neither 3G or 3B, but some other courtroom that uh, goes halfway. Maybe it's not as small as 3B. It's a little bigger, but it's also uh, it also has a better media room. So that I hope it's. Maybe there's going to be a third courtroom in play that the judge will assign. He doesn't have to grant the motion exactly as requested. He can accept some of the arguments made by the defense and then pick something that that works better for court administration and that works better for everybody, where there's less people, but also not drastically less. Yeah, I, I think that the judge shouldn't go there I definitely think that the, the the conduct of the people in the gallery was overall excellent and respectful of the proceedings. It was nothing like some of the other trials that I've seen, that Judge Everett has seen, because it was a Judge Everett trial, the one that I had concerns about that I mentioned. So I don't think that he should use this case for that purpose. There may be a particular case where that could be justified, you know, moving to a smaller courtroom. I think that there is certainly the power of the judge to do that. I think the judge can do that if he uh, feels uh, sufficient concern about the interference of the gallery and the behavior of the gallery. Uh, but I just don't see 3B working. It's just way too small. So you're going from something that is not even huge it was adequate, but not huge, to something like so tiny. It's just impossible. All right, thanks, everybody. Until next time, and to lawyer.